in the first chapter of his epistle to the Philippians, the Apostle Paul boldly declares his hope that the Lord will always be exalted through him, whether in death or life. The reason Paul states very clearly in verse 21, for me to live is Christ. This sentiment is the heartbeat of To Live as Christ Ministries and the Bible teaching of Dr. Wayne Barber. Wayne's intense love of Scripture and passionate desire to please the Father led him to pursue this conference-based outreach after more than 30 years of pulpit and Bible teaching ministry, a decision God has honored by keeping Wayne on the road most every week of the year. What you're about to hear is from the second installment of a powerful eight-part set in the series titled The Power of the Christ Life. Each message offers practical guidelines for understanding who you are in Christ and utilizing the limitless power of the cross to fulfill God's will for your life, now and forevermore. Wayne Barber knows that sanctification is a journey, and there's no better example of that principle than the one found in the Old Testament book of Jonah. Here now is our teacher with a look at how this prophet went from resistance to redemption. Finding grace in the midst of the storm. What we're looking at in these sessions right now, we've done several sessions for several weeks, but the session we're on right now is the fact that if we're going to find grace in the midst of the storm, we're going to have to understand that all of our trials are classrooms. We're going to have to trust these classrooms. God has something to teach us, whether we have done something wrong and the consequences now are upon us, whatever it is, God has something to teach us. Christianity does not have an arrival point. Christianity is not an arrival. It's a pursuit. So we always have something to learn. And flesh is such a subtle thing. And God will show us that in the midst of the storm. We're going to turn now to a book of Scripture that many of us have, have studied before. It's the book of Jonah. If you'll turn with me to the table of contents. <laughs> I say that because people have a difficult time finding the book of Jonah. If you know where Obadiah is, go right. It's right there. Uh, we had a pastor come to our church one time to speak <clears throat> when I was pastoring. And I was sitting up on the platform. And all of our people tended to think that if you knew the books of the Bible, you must be spiritual. Well, I knew, I, th I thought I knew them. And he said, turn to the book of Amos. And I could not remember where Amos was. And everybody in my church cut their eyes right over to me just to see if I was spiritual enough to know where Amos was. So I just opened my Bible, and it was awesome. And they said, whoa, that's good. And so I sat there and looked at Ezekiel while he preached out of Amos. <laughs> but I didn't tell them. <laughs> so when you find a book like Jonah, don't feel bad about going to the table of contents because... It doesn't mean that you're spiritual or unspiritual just because you can't find it. But the book of Jonah, my Bible, it's on page 1483. <laughs> that doesn't help you if you have a different translation. Jonah is an interesting character. Of all the characters in Scripture, I relate to Jonah, who ran from God, Jacob, who decided to do it his own way, and Peter, who always opened his mouth only to change feet. That's not a very good resume. Jonah's one of these guys that's going to have to learn in the midst of the storm. Different from Job, Job was bothering nobody, and God allowed this to come into his life. In fact, as far as men were concerned, he was blameless. He lived upright. He feared God. He turned from evil. And yet God still had some things to show him in his life. But now Jonah is different. Jonah is the rebellious one. In a sense, he is. He loved Israel more than he loved the God of Israel. Isn't it interesting? He loved the people of God more than he loved the God of the people. And he couldn't handle something that God was going to tell him. All of this takes place, the book of Jonah, 50 years before the Assyrian captivity. This is the, the tribes of Israel had split. There were 12 tribes of Israel. Ten tribes had gone to the north. That's called Israel. And two tribes had gone to the south. And that was called Judah. Judah and Benjamin were the two tribes in the south. This is the northern kingdom. And Assyria was about to take them over in about 50 years. Now, you have to understand something. God's going to tell him to do something, to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital city of the nation of Assyria. Fifty years before the Assyrians were going to take them into captivity. Remember what we've already learned in going through trials? In the fact that we have to trust the character of God or you will never listen to the word of God because God knows what he's doing and God is good, acceptable, perfect. His character is impeccable. He has the design. We don't have the design. And if you don't trust the God of the Word, you'll never live according to the Word of God. The Word of God is going to come to Jonah, and Jonah's going to have difficulty with it. And this begins to show some situations in his life. Well, let's enter in in verse 1 of chapter 1. It's kind of like an overview, and we'll, we'll, we'll open a lot of doors we can't close, and we won't cover every base. He says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, Go to Nineveh, the great city. Let me tell you about how great that city was. 
It was a great walled city, a huge high wall. When I say walled city, I mean high walls. It had a huge towers as you go through the main gate, like guard towers, that were just overwhelming. There were two huge mounds inside the city where the palaces sat of the rulers of that city and that, and that kingdom. The actual walls spanned an a, a, a area of seven and a half miles. There was about 1,800 acres inside the city. The moat out in front of it that protected the gate was 145 feet wide that you had to cross just to get into the gate. And it was the epitome of that day of strength, but at the same time, of idolatry. The idolatry that was inside of that city. And God says to Nineveh, now Nineveh is not a Jewish city. It has nothing to do with Israel. This is a Gentile, pagan, idolatrous city. And here's a prophet of God. The first prophet that I know of that was assigned the task to go to a Gentile city. And it says, that, go arise, verse 2, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, I love that phrase. Anytime the wickedness of man comes up before God, God wants to show mercy. We, man wants to get uh, vengeance, but God always wants to show mercy. Whenever sin surfaces, God wants to show mercy. So he commands Jonah to do that. Now, there's a dilemma that's going to come in his heart. He loves Israel, absolutely loves Israel. So when you think of Jonah as being rebellious, you have to be careful because he didn't go out living rebellious every day. But in this particular instance, he couldn't handle it because, like I said earlier, he loved the people of God more than he loved the God of the people. And he could not understand why God would send him to a pagan nation that was an enemy of his very own people. Well, he was in quite a dilemma, and he's going to have to make a choice. His choice helps us to understand where he is. In verse 3, we're going to see a drought coming in his life, and I have to explain that in a moment. Verse 3, but Jonah rose to go to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Now, Tarshish was exactly, if you had a map, here's Nineveh over here. Tarshish is exactly the opposite way. Now, isn't it interesting? We have Job, and God dealt with him. We, we've seen Abraham, many people in this study, but now we've got Jonah, and Jonah, is, he's, I'm not going to do it. I am not going to do it. I'm going the other way. He, so he, paid, he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. I want you to notice the word down in that verse. He, he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, went down into it to go with him from the presence of the Lord. It, it, it's, I'm, not, I'm sure I'm just playing with words here, but it is interesting to me when you choose to go against what God has said, not trusting his character, not realizing that his design is exactly right, it's a downhill slide from that point on. Down, down, down. By the way, one of the reasons he got in the down part of the ship, the lowest part of the ship, is because in a storm, that's the safest place to be. You don't feel the rocking of the waves as much there as you do up on deck. And so what's going to happen later on, you can understand why he's where he is.